Hi, everybody. Welcome to Lurking for Legends. Lurking for Legends is a live video cast where we interview guests from all walks of the publishing world. And today we're going to speak with Kit Davin, the author of the Weird Science Fantasy Series, Exeancy Trilogy, which includes The Forgotten Gemstone, The Other Castle, and The Starry Rise. Kit also writes suspenseful supernatural stories and is an advocate for the arts in all of its forms. Welcome to the show, Kit. Hi, thank you for having me. Hi, Kit. Hi, so, hi, David. So before we get going, uh, for people that don't know you, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and uh, what you do? Uh, I'm a crazy author. Um, I, I love to write. I've been writing since I was a kid. And uh, the weirder, the better. <laughs> and I've also been an occasional artist. So I, use, I sometimes paint and I sometimes do sculpting. And uh, at some point, I'd like to get back into drawing. Uh, I am also a part of a creative uh, group of friends who um, we are called Ramstar Games and we are uh, developing games and we're also designing board game paraphernalia. Uh, we, our, we, our latest project is um, a set of enamel pins that are based on the D&D roles uh, of the adventurers that you would play in D&D. Um, so I'm involved in writing and I'm involved in art. My husband's an artist. I can't not be involved in art in some capacity. And, uh, um, and we're, I, I'm a big board game addict as well. Um, that's about it. And occasionally I have a friend will come up to me and say, you know, I have this, this project, I need you to act in it. Uh, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> done a little bit of acting and uh yeah so i'm i'm willing to try just about anything once <laughs> that's awesome so with the advent of covid i have played D, &D quite regularly through especially 2020 and part of 2021 i've kind of laid back a bit now because i just getting uh, too much time spent <laughs> as you know uh, when you start playing those games uh so i was doing it twice a week for a while but and that's what I want to talk to you about was your board games. You've I, I met you at a, a few different events now, and uh, you know, Kit's a local author, and so I see Kit around town once in a while, and uh, we've spoken about her games. So this board game is it actually based on your books? No, it is not. Uh, it's it's funny, and it, we joke about this. The game is very different from any of the games we play. Uh, it's actually based on the ancient game of Go. Uh, so think of games like Othello and Reversi, and it has a B theme. And it's basically, the objective is to have as many of your, like there's two types of bees, worker bees and drone bees. And uh, the idea is that your your, your objective is to have mo the more of, most of your bees in the hive by the time the game is done. And if you do, you win. It's very simple. It's a lot of strategy. Uh, we're still developing it a little bit, and uh, we're hoping to make some decisions soon about it so that we can figure out if we're going to be doing a Kickstarter or if we're going to pitch it to someone or uh, maybe just throw it up there. Sorry, there's there's um, a website where you can post kind of similar to KDP where you can upload files and they'll, they'll publish your books. There's a, a place that you can upload your game and they will actually produce the game if people buy it. So it's like a, uh, they produce the game on demand uh, when if somebody orders it. So then that way, we're it's not on us to find capital to create this game and then try to sell it mm. to people who may or may not want it. Um, it's uh, it's very different from anything we play because most of the games my, my husband and I play together are dark fantasy. We've actually just finished Jaws of the Lion, which is uh, an entry uh, gateway game into Gloomhaven. And that is a massive game. It's a massive RPG game. And it just, uh, like you said, Richard, it's, uh, when we go to play it, we have to set a couple of hours aside to do this setup and play it. And yeah, it's just crazy. Um, but yeah, our game is very different from what, what we, we usually play. Uh, and if you see what we have on our shelves, it's Games based on Frankenstein, Dracula, um, Lovecraft. Uh, yeah, we have like all the classics, like Mansions of Madness and um, uh, El Retour and uh, oh God, we have a whole bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> so you describe yourself as an author of dark fiction and fantasy. Um, could you maybe just talk about a little bit about that and what that encompasses? 
I noticed, for instance, you have a book called The Cannibal's Handbook. Yeah. And I'm not sure I'm brave enough to read that one. I, I want to ask you about that, too. Is is it actually a recipe book? <laughs> no, it is not. And I kind of wish that I I I'd, um, either came up with a different title for the book, because I've had that question come up quite a bit. Uh, it's um, the Candles Handbook is is a it's more of a sus like dark suspense and it's got a supernatural element to it. Most of my stories, my dark fiction dark fiction has a supernatural element to it. The Candles Handbook is actually about an an, uh, an older woman like um like a senior, and she's uh, helping this young boy to survive long enough because the world that that everything storms have destroyed the um. The, the it's wiped out all the vegetation and but it's like dystopic but on the verge of not being dystopic again because uh, everything's coming back like it was a temporary wiping of the planet um in the meantime people are, have been trying to stay alive long enough and of course have resorted to cannibalism and it's this this old woman trying very hard to keep this young person alive this young boy uh, uh, teaching him the right way and the wrong way to eat people because if you don't eat them properly, bad things happen. Um, and it, it's, I call it dark fiction. It's more, it's more suspense. It's not uh, like when you say horror, a lot of people their go to is slasher films and gory, gory stuff. Uh, I uh, I don't have an issue with that, but I, I it's not my forte. My forte is suspense. Um, even in my fantasy fiction, I do suspense, and that that's very different. <clears throat> so that's not marketed as horror per se, because a lot of people when they think horror, they just go to that one thing, you know, slasher serial killers and slasher mm -hmm. fiction, uh, slash, slasher horror. So, <clears throat> so. The covers on your Zanisi series, um, they're really atmospheric. And I notice, um, like in your, your bio and everything, you mentioned that you're an artist and a sculptor, sculptor, sorry, sculptor. <laughs> and so I was just kind of curious, um, uh, do you get involved in your own covers? Do you design your own covers or do you like have somebody else do that? Uh, the ZNC trilogy has, actually has uh, two types of covers. The original covers were done uh, by my husband. He did, um, and, and those look, they're beige. They have a beige textured background, and then they have um, um, kind of like a trompe l'oeil uh, illustration on the, on, the, on the front. And those were all done by my husband, and they're still available in print only on Amazon. And but with the new covers that I've done, I did those, and I've been dabbling with a lot of graphic design over the years and teaching myself. And I wanted to capture something. I wanted to capture a type of style um, of cover that might be more appealing, because I've had a lot of people come back and say that um, the artwork doesn't appeal to them. It reads really young, and I'm like, okay, okay. So, you know, you take it in, you listen, you adjust, but I, I also still really love my husband's artwork and I didn't want to just completely give it up. Uh, so I decided to keep a legacy edition because I know some people have bought the books and they want all their, like if they go to come back and buy the others, they want their trilogy to look the same, right? Um, they don't like the all the different color uh, covers. Uh, so I, I kept the legacy a legacy edition with the original art, and then everything else is the new stuff, the new the new card, uh, cover art. That's interesting. I actually make my own covers as well, and it's uh, very very challenging. I find coming up with the idea, and uh, I'm kind of self taught. It's not something I have a background in. It's just something that I. Uh, I decided I was going to try, and so far it's worked out. I'm not sure if it will work out forever. <laughs> but you know, I'm not getting away with it. <laughs> it's such a learning experience. I'm the same way. I've been teaching myself uh, over the years, of course, getting feedback from my husband. I have books on design, and then just studying cover art um, mm. and trying my best to do something that fits in with the genre, but also 
sticks out a little bit, you know? Mm. Yeah, that's one of the things I like as well with mine is like I, I I like to try and make them a little bit different to what you would perhaps normally see in for like the genre that I write in. Mm -hmm. Make them a little bit more individualistic. Yes. Yeah. So you were saying is it the Xenzi trilogy yes. that the artwork people say is more YA? The uh yeah, Sean's covers. Uh, like well, my husband's covers, his artwork. Um, Red oh, his artwork they think is more YA. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm just looking at your website. Not now. mine. Not my covers. No. <laughs> with the forgotten gemstone, you got you got the bird with the gemstone, and then the upside inverse castle and the starry rise. Uh, those are my. Those are okay. My yeah, covers. I was gonna say they definitely do not yeah. look YA to me. No, no. Okay. No. Yeah. All right. So. so, between the two of you, you know. You probably know that I put interior pictures of mine. Is that something you've ever done, or is that something that you consider doing because the both of you uh, have an artistic background? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? that interior part pictures. Have you ever considered putting interior pictures oh. in your book? Um, if if nothing else, I, even to format, you know how sometimes they format the chapter pages. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not. I don't. I didn't do that for a Zenity trilogy, um, but for the Candles Handbook and Spider Spun, the the print versions of these have illustrations in them. They they the one has illustrations by Sean and the other one has illustrations that I did. Uh, yeah, but the print format for the Cannibals Handbook and uh, Spider Spun, because they're not long enough to be printed in a book, like in a book format, I had them printed up uh, like comic books, like single issue comic books. So they're they're about that size, and they're they got uh, the staples in the side, and they read like little magazines. So they're they they were fun to do a fun project, and I'm, I'm very proud of them. So how many pages would they be then if they, if you can't actually get them into a, a perfect balanced spine? Uh, the stories themselves run anywhere from nine to eleven thousand words, and the comic books I believe are can't remember now I think 16 pages yeah 16 16 or 18 pages they're not oh, very big wow. they're like the size of a single issue comic book yeah yeah okay um, well, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah and they're they're formatted into columns and they have illustrations and they're set up and when you look at them they're like a little little magazine and I'm thinking I might do another one at some point down the road yeah I noticed we your website's under construction, so I was clicking on a couple of links. Uh, that's all I got on it. Uh, now, you'd mentioned off air that uh, you, you want to be careful when you commit to uh, saying stuff uh, with regards to appearing somewhere. Uh, do you have any events lined up this year as far as uh, book events? I, I know you and I did one recently uh, locally, just a tiny little event uh, with, with things opening up. Is this uh, something that you're looking forward to? Is this something you've got planned yet? Or is it somewhere we can uh, find I have, Yeah, I have no major events planned this year. I, uh, because of commitments with my, my with Ramstar Games, I have to be very careful about um, committing to anything that's going to take up a lot of time. Uh, so when opportunities come to me to do like a one day event, like I did the Gulf Book Fair, uh, I, I will... And if, if it's not too costly, then yes, I will consider doing it. Uh, I, I'm probably going to be sticking local this year uh, and in the Cambridge, Guelph, Kitchener area, if possible. I just, uh, unfortunately, because of time, um, I don't want to overcommit myself. I did that last year and burned out, and I, I can't do that again. And also, uh, finances are a little low for us right now. The pandemic just killed us financially. And uh, we have to really watch our money, unfortunately. Yeah. Hopefully, so, hopefully, maybe after 2022, uh, going into 2023, things might be better. And I can start thinking about doing those big conventions again. Because I do enjoy them. I do. Uh, I usually do add Astra every year. For, for so sure. we have a question from Wanda. She says, Kate, who are your favorite thriller writers? Uh, um, 
I, oh, geez. I don't have a favorite thriller writer. Uh, I, hmm, how do I put this? I have my favorite novels, like Silence of the Lambs for sure. So uh, I definitely would probably write, read anything by Thomas Harris uh, at that, cause just because of the Silence of the Lambs. Um, and uh, I don't know if Stephen King would fall into that because I, to me, he's a, a thriller writer. He's not necessarily a horror writer all the time. Uh, I do like his work and I like his work by his son, Joe Hill, big fan of Joe Hill's work, love his stories. Um, what else? Oh, um, Lincoln and Child. Yeah, Lincoln and Child. So I think, am I saying that right? I always get their names wrong. Um, I can't remember if it's Preston and Child or Lincoln and Child. Okay. Uh, so yeah, those, those are some of my favorites. It's interesting you mentioned Silence of the Lambs because uh, that's not my genre that I choose to read, but uh, I did read Silence of the Lambs and I must say I really enjoyed that book. And then I watched I the movie and that's right out of my character. I do not watch movies like that. I, I would hide <laughs> under a blanket. But uh, I, I watched I, it, and uh, I could not believe of all the movies. You know, they say the the movie is never uh, lives up to the book. They they mm -hmm. cast they cast the the main character perfectly. And oh then, yeah, yeah, for sure. But it was almost like every line was line for line verbatim of the book. They did such a wonderful job with that movie. I was very impressed. Yeah, they did. I have to tell you a story about my grandmother. Okay, so bless her soul, she. Um, Years, years and years ago, when the movie just came out, uh, I was telling her about this movie. You know, I'd seen it. And I was like, just raving about it. And she's like, mm hmm, mm hmm, like this. And I said, and it's based on a book. I'm going to have to get that book and read it, right? Because I, I had no, no idea that it had been based on a book. And uh, she got up from her chair and she went over to the bookshelf and she kind of pulled some books off and reached behind the books pulled out another book handed it to me and it was a hardcover edition of the silence of the lambs and she said to me she said you know i read this book uh, a while ago and she said on i i thought there was something wrong with me because i loved it so much <laughs> <laughs> so she hid it away and uh so i got to read it i got to read the book because my nana had it <laughs> it was very well written and do you have that book now? Did you uh, manage I to hang do on? not. I do not have it anymore. Um, I'm actually on the hunt for a nice collector's edition of it. Um, I unfortunately, I lived a, alone for a while in Toronto. I was on my own and I had like boxes and boxes of books. And uh, in a, an attempt to purge and downsize, I, I got rid of about 50 boxes of books. I gave them to a friend of mine and he took them up to his cottage. And I bet you any money it's sitting there in those books. But, uh, you know, sometimes you have to let things go. Mm -hmm. I just think it would be neat if you could get a hold of that edition. That you yeah. Could grab it would be. Kind of sentimental. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. I, uh, I'm originally from um, Great Britain and when I came over, like and emigrated to Canada, um, the only things that I brought with me were my clothes and a whole bunch of books. <laughs> Everything else I just left yeah. behind. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, go ahead, Dave. Sorry, um, I was just going to say. Um, so, you know, the dark speculative themes. Uh, is this something that? Um, your stories have always been about, uh, even when you you know you first started writing, or is it something that you've kind of moved towards later on in, as you've developed? Uh, my some of my earliest, oh, I remember this. So in uh, grade eight, I think it was grade eight, um, we were you know you get these assignments to write short stories, and I wrote a short story about a serial killer and the discovery of the body and all that stuff. And uh, I wasn't the only one. I think there were a lot of other kids in the class who were really into horror too, and they all wrote horror stories. And the teacher flipped out on us. Uh, he's like, you know, there are other subject matters. You know, you guys are all disturbed and and, and terrible. <laughs> but uh, I've had a fascination with um, darker fiction since I was very young. Um, 
starting with fairy tales because uh, the Disney ones are so <laughs> watered down. <laughs> But when you start reading some of the original ones, you're like, "Whoa, that's that's pretty gruesome," you know. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the like the Grimm's fairy tales and whatever. I mean, those are very very gruesome tales if you read the originals. Yeah, oh, yeah I mean, then sure. they don't they don't really bear any resemblance to the Disney versions at all. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, I grew up on the Disney stuff too, but at, at some point, I just kind of flipped. And I uh, was reading uh, Edgar Allan Poe and ghost stories. I think uh, one of my favorite books as a kid was an edition of, um, I believe it was Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And it was an anthology of short stories. And that's where I discovered Ray Bradbury because he was in that collection and uh, a bunch of other authors. And yeah, I just, I just gravitate toward the stuff that's darker. I like creepy and eerie and atmospheric and suspenseful stuff more so than the uh, the slaughter fests although as a kid i didn't really understand and i just kind of you know wrote I what found, i saw in movies <laughs> i found it interesting you talked about your teacher and the him having such a negative reaction to you guys writing what you did and it, that's such a shame uh when I was in elementary school, I had this one teacher who read this book I wrote, and it was it was a horrible book, I admit it. But uh, he never once tried to correct anything. He never once tried to tell me, you know, do this, maybe you should do that. He just said, good job, keep, keep writing. And he was such an inspiration to me. So that being said, did you have a mentor growing up with regards to uh, your own writing? Um, before I answer that question, I just want to do a quick follow-up story about that same teacher. Oh, certainly. Uh, later, ahead. yeah, later in that that year, I went back to him. We had to to do some sort of special project assignment, and I went to him and I said, "I'd like to write a mystery. I'd like to write a mystery story." And he said, "Yeah." And uh, I got a very good grade on it. And I asked him, I said, "Am I going to get it back?" And he goes, "No, no. We have to hold on to that for um, for." Uh, I, I need to hold on to it, he said, and I never got it back. So I think he secretly liked it and just didn't give it back to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay. You didn't make a copy? Enough. No, no, back then, Whoa, this is way before computers. Uh, we had oh, a typewriter geez. and hell no, I was not going to sit at a typewriter <laughs> and type that out. Oh, Wanda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Wanda says maybe your teacher was a closet serial killer and the story was too close to, too home. Close to home. I love that. I love that. <laughs> so when it comes to mentors, I've had very encouraging. Nobody's actually been hands on with me. I, I've, I've been mostly self-taught. I have had English teachers who are very encouraging to two English teachers, Miss Wilson and Miss Hahian, uh, to um, two different high schools. I went to two different high schools, but uh, they were both very encouraging. And um, I, I'm one of those people that I will go to a workshop and someone will give me advice and I'll take it and run with it. And I will, I, I, I've been learning a lot from a lot of different writers over the years. Uh, so. And do you write full time? And I, I, I should have asked you this before when I, you know, because I have seen you at a few different events. And unfortunately, I don't get enough time uh, to talk to you because we're doing other stuff. But yeah, yeah, uh, I used to write full time. It's not working out for me though. Uh, I need to get back into actually bringing in an income. I don't bring in enough with my books, and uh, I am doing freelance right now until I can find something. But even the freelance isn't really bringing in a lot either. So uh, I write part time. And it's excruciating because I would love to be a full-time writer. Uh, again, however, it's just not plausible right now. <clears throat> so I, I see that um, you've got a fancy anthology coming out that you're co-editing. Yes. Is that right? Um, That's correct. Could, could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the project started, uh, we started discussing it last year. I am working with, it, it's not even actually my idea. It's uh, my writer friend, Sarah Waterraven. Uh, she is a, from, uh, she lives in Guelph, I believe. Yeah, so she's from the area. And we met years ago at uh, Ad Astra. And just at the beginning of the pandemic, I joined her writing group. 
and it's a great writing group and we she's always wanted to do this anthology and try to kind of get the people in our writing group the first chance and opportunity to be a part of the anthology and i said i'd love to help you out with that and uh what started off as possibly just helping with formatting uh, the ebooks and the print books actually became a co-editing partnership and and we've I've, we've both had our hands in I mean, I've helped, I'm helping out. I'm still kind of like, um, like she's the senior editor and I'm like a, a junior editor. Uh, and, uh, but it just kind of seeing this project work, um, like seeing the project evolve from the beginning, cause we just put out our contracts. We, we, we have all our submissions and we put out contracts to the authors and now we're getting ready to actually dive into developmental editing and, and the works. and. It's been an interesting process. And it's called Raven's Hollow Presents Heavily of Happily Ever After. We thought it would be nice to do like um, high fantasy with happy endings as a uh, to help people who are stressed out and anxious about the pandemic. Uh, we, we figured we'd start off with something that's upbeat uh, as an anthology. Now, this is the one that you approached me about. Uh last late last year is it not yes it is and i apologize i did not get back to you with techniques for writing short stories because oh no um, that's okay I I, over I, over scheduled <laughs> i have a hard time saying hi under five thousand words so i would have difficulty writing a short story so when you mention it to me i go oh, i don't think i can do that but as you're sitting here talking and you mentioned the word raven all of a sudden i had this little short story come into my head and i'm thinking oh i could have wrote that for that anthology there's, I've got no. a raven in one of my books, actually, and uh, he's a very uh, endearing character. But there's a, there's a, he's got a bit of a, a story before you actually meet him. And I'm thinking, oh, oh, I okay. could write that little story about him coming into the witch's uh, presence. And But, yeah, so well, maybe next time you do one, let me know. Yeah, ne next time, definitely. Uh, I also have trouble with writing short fiction and keeping it um, short. Uh, we do have, a, for the anthology, it was an 8,000 word maximum. Uh, so um, yeah. that's why there's gonna be fewer stories in it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we hope. I hope there'll be more. Uh, again, we have to see it through the end and, and see where it takes us uh, and see how we feel after working with each other. Uh, I do hope that it's something that we can continue to do. Yeah. When I was first starting writing, I actually wrote quite a few short stories um, effectively as a way of kind of practicing and getting quick results. So I actually find that sort of like, you know, reasonably easy. Um, although now I don't write them because I don't yeah, have time. I, it's a challenge <laughs> and they don't sell very well either. I mean, typically, I mean, they seem to be very poor sellers. So, you know, why invest all of that time in a short story? But uh, I do actually find them quite uh, interesting because it gives you the freedom to, you know, try different things out, um, but and you know, get much quicker results than obviously if you were in kind of like a hundred thousand words or in Richard's case, you know, half a million. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So one of the things that I noticed in your last newsletter. Uh, you mentioned that you're using Amazon ads to test out these alternate cover designs. Um, yes. So how does that work? And is it something that you'd recommend, you know, for other people? Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know if I would recommend it. You have to be really careful with Amazon ads because if you're, the keywords are very important. Um, that you're choice in keywords. Uh, if you're trying to, uh, just to give you an example, um, someone had mentioned that my original covers look or reminded them of manga uh, in anime. And she said, you should, you know, and I thought, mm, maybe I should try that. But then I realized, you know, with the way AMS ads are set up, if I were to put in that as a keyword, which is, and people search using that keyword and they find my book, Yes, they'll click on the ad, which I'm going to end up paying for, but then they're going to see that it's not an illustrated story. It's not a graphic story. 
You know what I mean? And they're going to be like, no, I'm not going to buy this because it's not right. anime. It's not manga. And so you have to be really careful with your keyword uh, choices. And the beauty, though, with AMS ads, because uh, I've been trying to rack my brain about how I could promote my books uh, full retail price without constantly having to drop the prices on them all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought, well, I'll give AMS ads a try. And sure enough, they you use you can have keywords set up to target um, people looking for those genres. And then they have what are called negative keywords, which you can put in, uh, which they will not show impressions to people who are, let's say, looking for free books. So if you can find every version of uh, keyword expression that like free Kindle books or hmm. free science fiction, free fantasy, and you list them, they will actually suppress the ad so that people with who are using those search terms won't see it. And they won't click through because you'll just end up spending money and not getting any any buys. So that's interesting. I use uh, yeah. Kindle ads myself, and I've never realized that you could do the negative keywords. Mm-hmm. I'll have to look so into the, that. Yeah. So the beauty is with the the campaign that I'm running right now, um, it's it's getting a lot of impressions, uh, a few clicks though. And it may be because it's new. People have not seen these covers before. Mm. Uh, generally, I've been told that, you know, it takes a person 10 times to see something before they, they click on it or act on it, right? And and so this is giving me an opportunity to get the book seen without mm. spending a lot of money. I gave myself a budget of $50. I've made a few sales. Uh, I, I think I've probably got another week left where, and then I'm going to have to shut them down, but it, it was, it was good. It, 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 um, there wasn't a lot, the click through wasn't great, but, uh, there was something which means people are responding to the covers mm. and that's, I don't know if it's probably the best way to test a cover, uh, but it was about all I had in me to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty. I was still recovering from last year, and I really stripped that, stripped back my marketing. And I now, whenever I, I go into something, I'm like, what's the least amount of effort and energy mm. that I can do to promote my books now? <laughs> it's very easy to get sucked into kind of like doing all of these things, and it just yeah. literally mm. just burns up all your time, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. But I, I think for our most effective marketing uh, and um the ads have been good i've done paid promos in the past as well that have been good again though it was i had to make my book free and yeah i may have gotten about three thousand downloads for that but i I saw very few sales Mm -hmm. and um i think i make the majority of my sales on facebook and through my newsletter Hmm. because people know me on facebook yeah no it's a tough slog trying to uh figure out those Amazon ads. Uh, I yeah, spent a lot of money on Facebook ads last year and I didn't get one sale out of it. So, you know, no, I, 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 I won't do Facebook ads them, anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, the reach on Facebook ads is, is no, it's not good anymore. People are suppressing ads. Um, I'm, I'm one of them. I see ads popping up on my feed and I'll just turn mm-hmm. them off, turn them off, turn them off. And uh, my friend does the same thing. There's just a point where it's just too much and their organic reach isn't there anymore. So that's a waste of money as far as I'm concerned. We spent a lot of ads uh, trying to promote Ramstar Games last year for our Kickstarter and for other various projects and very little came from it. And like you said, Richard, it, um, uh, sorry, I'm I distracted. No, no, no it's okay. I, should, I, I put it up too <laughs> soon. Sorry, I shouldn't have put it up there and distract yeah. you. I'll take it down. You, you go ahead and finish and I'll bring it back up. Oh no, I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> That's my train of thought. <laughs> oh, it's about the Facebook ads, yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I, I've never been able to get those to work. Um, but I've, yeah. I've not found Facebook a good platform for anything, quite frankly. No, no, but no. There, I mean, for just, I mean, for general, kind of like connecting with people, sure. But I mean, in terms of marketing and what have you, especially the way they've throttled back the reach that you have, it's just. Yeah. No, there's nothing there. Yeah, they're no. cutting their own throat, I think, in the long run. But uh, anyway, so Wanda's got another question for you here. Yeah. So what so kind of freelance writing do you do, and how do you market it? 
Oh, okay. I, I don't do freelance writing because if I do freelance writing, I won't write my own stuff. The, the freelance that I do is what I call writing adjacent. So I do transcription, I do book formatting, and uh, eventually I'd like to get into proofreading as well. Uh, I um, have not had a chance to officially market it because um, I'm still, I'm, I have my first transcription repeat client and they've been keeping me busy and I've been doing work through transcription service companies. Uh, and I, I'm waiting to like with my first client, he's having interviews published in cemetery dance magazine. And I'm waiting for him to say, yeah, it's published. And then I'm going to start building my portfolio for, for, for these, um, uh, services that I, that I'm going to offer. Cause I'd love to get more, more work from, uh, let's say authors and podcasters who want to convert their, um, episodes or their interviews into transcripts because um, that's the only way the SEO will ever pick up uh, what they're doing because an SEO can't crawl video. It, it can't read the content of a video. So it needs something to com uh, to be a companion to it that it can crawl and then get seen and, and picked up. Thanks, Wanda. <laughs> So you um, you have a red bubble star, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. So how did you find that in terms of like setting it up and and make, you know building it and and so on? And have you got any plans to expand that? Uh, it's very new. It's new to me uh, as of this year, and it's actually very easy to set up. And uh, I've only, I, I haven't even really fully completed all the steps yet. I just, um, it's something I'm doing for fun. And uh, um, I have like one, three products up right now. And I think you need five, I think, before they consider you official. And uh, I just, um, I'm hoping to get around to getting some more up soon. But I thought I'd, I, I wanted to focus on notebooks and journals and anything writing related. Uh, so, but it's, it's actually pretty easy to, to do. I mean, if you've got the skills, uh, to put the Im images together, uh, and I've started with the cover art for, um, my books for the Zenus trilogy. So, and eventually I'll get on to, I've got some favorite photographs that I want to put on notebooks as well. Mm. Um, so I know you might've touched on this before, but, uh, Actually, I want to ask you also the Xinzi series. I, I, we talked about this before went online. I'm probably screwing this word up again, but uh, it, nope, do you have good. Any good plans for that to go into book four, or is is this series done? It's a trilogy. It's uh, this particular character that the trilogy follows, Ule. She's. Uh, hmm. I, I never want to say I'm completely done with anything because once I do, my brain starts to go, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going to prove you wrong. And then I'm, I'm writing that next trilogy, you know? You sound like um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I do have a couple side projects that are spinoffs from the trilogy, but they're not continuations of Ule's character arc. They're, they're continuations of other minor characters in the stories and um i but i've decided to um put the fantasy aside for a little while because i have ideas for dark fiction starting to pile up and i need to get get them out of me and then i'll probably go back to the fantasy and i knew that going into this that i needed to have two genres that i could go back and forth between because um i i have this tendency to get a little fatigued and when i do i switch to another genre and then until i get fatigued with that one then i switch back and uh, that way I don't get um, unappreciative of what we, what the writers are, the stories mm -hmm. writers are telling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. Um, my uh, first series, there's four books in that. And uh, I didn't plan to do a, tr a, a trilogy or four books or anything. It was just originally meant to be a standalone. And, and then kind of yeah. after I finished it, I, I just kind of, so hang on, there's more in this. 
Yeah. And so I wrote the second, and then while I was writing that, I thought, no, there's still more. So I wrote the third, and then my wife basically complained about the third one, and I scrapped 75,000 words of it, and uh, wrote another third one, and then, but then I still had more to write, so I wrote the fourth. But it's like every time it's been kind of like, I'm kind of getting done here, you know? <laughs> and now I've kind of like, I've finished the, the quadrilogy, I guess. And, right. and, quadrilogy, yeah. Quadrilogy, yeah. Yeah, that sounds and, about uh, right. Yep. And I'm sort of, yeah, I'm, I'm done. I can't do any more Joe Ballon. It's kind of like, I, I've kind of like done him to death. But it's like, I don't want to say I'm never going to do it anymore, Joe no. Ballon, because like you said, you know, you don't know how your brain's going to turn out, you know. Right. It's like, I mean, there's a lot of authors kind of like historically where they've done kind of like a load of books and then, you know, they've stopped and then later they've gone back to them. Or you've had other authors, I mean, like, for instance, Conan Doyle, who historically absolutely hated Sherlock Holmes, like, after he'd <laughs> done so many, he, he didn't want to touch the damn thing, you know. Yeah. And it's like, you know, so what do you do? You have to go with what you feel is right for you, don't you, you know? You do. So, you do. Yeah. Let me put this in your head, Dave. Uh, you, you'll start <laughs> writing like me. So uh, when we meet Joe Bellin in Mathematics of Eternity, he's had, uh, he's had quite a life already. Mm. And I, I think your readers need to actually read the story that leads into Mathematics of Eternity. <laughs> so I hope you uh, don't get too much sleep tonight as your mind just mulls out over it. Funny you should mention that, Richard. <laughs> I actually have started writing a short story, which is the story of how Joe and Dolly first meet. That's awesome. And I know an, <laughs> an anthology that uh, Kit might be able to get you into. <laughs> So, get just before we wrap up here, I think we're at the end of our day, or end of our end of our day, end of our show, end of our day too, I guess. Already? So, <laughs> when can we expect your next project out? I know you're uh, you're embroiled in this uh, game manufacturer and everything else is going along with that, but as far as your books go, uh, when can your readers expect your next book out, or is there anything definite? Oh yeah, I, I'm actually currently working on a novel. Um, it'll be my first novel in a while since the trilogy. And uh, uh, I'm hoping, my goal is to have the first draft done by the end of the year. Um, and it will be the official first book in the Edgeport City series that I'm working on, which is Supernatural Suspense. And Edgeport City is a fictional city based on Toronto here in Canada. And uh, yeah, I, I don't really want to say too much more because it's still in the early stages. Will it have a big tower? Possibly. Yeah, <laughs> I, I got to think about that. I got to think about that. Yeah, because it's, uh, again, it's supernatural suspense. And uh, Edgeport City is this place where I'm kind of doing this homage to all the dark fiction, all the horrors, mystery thrillers that I've read. Just to give you an example, uh, one of my favorite authors is Clive Barker. I think he mm. does a lot. He does lovely fantasy horror. And uh, I have a street called Barker Boulevard. So there's going to be places named oh, after cool. authors, you know, like the, the, the hotel chain is called the Howard Phillips, um, you know, and, 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 and David and drive. Still, yeah. Uh, Grant university is my favorite because growing up, I used to read a lot of Charles L. Grant. And nice. uh, so that that's in honor of him. And I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with the world building and, and it's a, a little bit of a, it's very creative world building, but at the same time, I don't have to invent everything from scratch mm -hmm. because it's set in the real world. So I don't have to worry about inventing a money system or a language system, or it's just, it's just the city that I'm having fun with. Right? For sure. I, I look forward yeah. to see reading about Stephen street as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so where can people find your books if they're looking for them? Oh, they, they're, they're on most of the platforms, you know, the regular ones, Amazon, uh, Kobo, Barnes and Noble. Uh, they're on Google Play. Uh, if you, if people just go to my website at kitdavin.com, uh, I have universal book links set up to all of these places. And oh, awesome. uh, David put that up for you. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's actually Dave did that one. That keeps coming to my name, but uh, David's been <laughs> typing in there. So, no, that's awesome. And, uh, we're, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but where else? 
Oh, I'm, I'm also encouraging people to reach out to me directly because I do have in, oh, inventory, oh, gosh, inventory of the uh, legacy covers editions, and I'd be happy to sign them and send them out um, for anybody. And it will become collector items if they're uh, going to be the discontinued covers. Yeah. So. yeah, eventually at some point. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah. right. Those are the covers to get your hands on for sure. So for David and myself, we both thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we appreciate yeah, thank uh, you, you yeah. spending time yeah. with us and uh, telling thank us about so your, books, your book games and everything else. So if yeah, you ever, yeah. ever want to come back on and uh, if you, like when you get your uh, game going or you get your book uh, published next year and you want to come in and talk about it, then by all means, hit me up and we'll get you back on. Okay, awesome. That's great. This was fun. Thanks, guys. Oh, you're most welcome, Rick. Most delighted to be here today, especially being a local okay. author. It's always fun to have the local authors in here with us. So, yeah, so absolutely. Dave, uh, what's new in the David Kelly universe? Um, I've been busy editing the second of my uh, Logan Two Feathers books. Uh, that's been somewhat interrupted over the last couple of days due to some very crazy server problems and internet hosting problems, but uh, the work goes on and the release date is now set. So it will be out on July the 6th. Nice. So not if everything away. goes well, not too far <laughs> away. <laughs> yeah, not too far away. So with regards to my <laughs> own stuff, I'm still working on uh, Wind Walker Book 3 and High Cliff Guardian series. And I've been very busy the last few weeks trying to set up uh, different places to go sell my books uh, with mm. the restrictions starting to ease in Ontario. Hopefully the last, uh, maybe we'll get out and do some uh, book shows again. So I was just talking the day before online. There's a, there's one that uh, I'm eyeing uh, in Southern Ontario near the end of April. So I'm looking forward to getting out there again and meeting all the people that I met uh, a couple of years ago in 2019. So that's about what's new in the Stevens universe. So next week, on Lurking for Legends, we welcome literary fiction author Ariane Torres. Ariane attended Mount I'm going to shoot, Holyoke. There has to be a pronunciation guide with a lot of these words, and this is even fantasy. Ariane attended Mount Holyoke College. Maybe if I could speak properly. Major in Russian studies and English literature. Her graduate work at the Corcoran College of Art and Design in Columbia University focused on prison architecture and aging in prison respectively. She has also worked in interior design and prison advocacy. So myself, personally, I'm going to enjoy speaking to her about my time in prison. But, <laughs> well, you know what I mean when I say my time in prison. I, <laughs> when I used to work for the, yeah. Anyway, for Christy Stranders, who couldn't be here tonight, David and Kelly and myself, we hope everyone has a safe and happy week ahead. Until we meet again, take care. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye.